morning and welcome to this webinar on the National Health Information Strategy. So I guess it's a subject which uh, many of us are taking even more interest in now with the uh, repercussions of COVID when the demand for authoritative inf health information has become even more vital. I'm Mark Metherell from the Communication Consumers Health Forum in Australia, and I'll chair today's webinar, which is being sponsored by the Consumers Health Forum and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, which, as you know, is Australia's uh, premier uh, health and social statistics gatherer. We've got four panellists to discuss the health information strategy from diverse but knowledgeable perspectives. They are Leanne Wells, the CEO of the Consumers Health Forum, Jenny Hargraves, Hargreaves, who heads uh, AIHW's Data Governance Group, Neville Millen, who's a Victorian health researcher and a consumer advocate, and the person who's been playing such a central role in informing us about the implications of COVID-19, and that's uh, ABC Coronacast expert, Dr. Norman Swan. For the initial part of today's proceedings, each of uh, the four panelists will uh, have some time to each give their perspective. And then for the second half, it will be over to comments from you, the audience, and any questions. And thank you to all of those who've already sent us in comments and questions. We're keen to get your comments as much as questions because we are, after all, trying to gauge what the community and consumer interests are in this. Mm -hmm. um, the second half will be the Q&A, as I say. Uh, then we'll conclude with a wrap up, a brief wrap up from Norman to briefly summarize the main points. Uh, if you'd uh, like to ask the panel or put uh, comments, please post them in the Zoom chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can. We also recommend that you make sure your Zoom is set at speaker view, not gallery view, so you can see the speaker more easily. Now, on to our first panellist, Leanne Wells. Leanne. Uh, thanks, Mark. And I should mention that um, I'm here as a, as a member of the um, independent expert panel that's been working with the AIHW on the National Information, National Health Information Strategy. So I'll just make a few opening remarks from, I suppose, that perspective, but, all, but also from CHF's perspective. Um, and really just to introduce why, why is a national health information strategy in development in the first place. Um, and I, I guess the short answer to that is it's happening because health information and importantly how we use health information is an important asset in our health system. So our national data sets, institutions, infrastructure are really important to our overall health architecture. What we need is a future plan for health information and how we invest in it. I think when, when consumers, when the community think about an investment in our health system, many of them about hospitals and Medicare, preventative health measures, they're the things that touch us every day and affect our access to care. It's so probably to say that health data and information is probably not something that captures the public's imagination, but it is important that we think about how we rely on it. It's important that we think about how we rely on it to shape policy and programs and services. And that's not to say that as individuals, we don't care about who's accessing our personal health data. We certainly do. And as Mark said, I think it's equally fair to say at the moment that many of us have a heightened awareness and appreciation of the power and place of health information and data as we monitor now the, the daily national and global COVID statistics and trends. So the NHIS is happening because the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council recognised that timely and accurate health information, including data, is a critical part of the evidence base. That's the foundation for good health care. It's what decision from the, on and what the health system is performing is far from static. So some of the drivers, I guess, 
um, around the decision by the Ministerial Council to develop the NHIS include things like the rapid change in technology, in analytics and the democratisation of data, changing expectations around data availability. An important issue for us, enhanced need for trust and social licence at all levels, particularly from the public in terms of how and why their data is being used and by who. We certainly know from national research that CHF has done with nationally representative samples that um, that matters, that social licence and consent matters. Consumers want ownership and control over their data, transparency, and that's an important design principle you would have seen drawn out in the strategy consultation documents is a key to that. Another driver is the emergence of big data and new forms of highly detailed data collection, sometimes available digitally in very raw form. And then there are the challenges of the various legislative, regulatory and technical arrangements that can impede or, or, or enable, depending on how you look at it, the provision of high quality data that can be shared and used for public good. And then the other thing, of course, was the, the sense by, by RMAC and, and others advising RMAC like the AHW that despite these changes and emerging trends, the question has got to be asked, um, and the answer to this is probably no, we don't. Um, do we fully harness the power of existing data for research, policy, planning, and personal purposes? And how could a national strategy that's forward looking enable that? So that's just a little bit about why it's happening. Um, as I said, an independent expert panel chaired by Mike Daub, who couldn't be with us today, has been formed. AIHW is the secretariat for this piece of work and we've been working on developing the strategy and consulting a number of stakeholders and that those consultations Norman has been leading over recent months. Um, so I think that's probably enough from me by way of introduction, Mark, thank you. Other than to say CHF is a, is a strong supporter of this strategy. We've had pleasingly active engagement by our members in all of the consultation forums around the country. Um, and we're pleased to host this webinar today to continue that conversation with consumers and those with an interest in healthcare consumer affairs about the strategy to get some further feedback about how it's shaping up. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, now I'll ask Ginny Hargreaves from AIHW to talk a little about the uh, the development of the National Health Information Strategy and perhaps if possible to give an example how it could improve things for consumers. Jenny. Thanks very much Mark <clears throat> um, and thanks Leanne for that uh, introduction for us. I think that really covered off a lot of the reasons that we're doing this work and I think a lot of the reasons that AHW saw as um, being drivers for the need for a National Health Information Strategy there isn't really something that, that one could look at and call a national health information strategy now. So we're really very much looking forward to having a national approach um, to ensure that we've got sort of joined up data systems and information systems in the future that will benefit everyone, I think, or I'm hoping in the community. Um, just to, to um, let people know, uh, the independent expert panel, Leanne is a, a member and we're very appreciative of, of, the, of that fact and the fact that she can uh, uh, connect well to consumers' um, voices in that regard. Um, Mike Daub, um, a professor of public health in, in WA, is the chair, as Leanne mentioned. The other three panel members are, are Professor Michael Kidd, who is an eminent um, uh, general primary care um, researcher and is now actually in a, holding a position of deputy chief health officer in the Commonwealth Department of Health. You may have seen him talking about COVID. Uh, 19 on the TV on occasion. Um, also, um, Professor Louisa Jorm from the University of New South Wales, and she's an eminent health researcher focusing on how best to use big data in health. And um, Dr. Kalinda Griffiths, who is a, also from the University of New South Wales, it's very important we feel to have good connections to the voices of Indigenous peoples with this work. Um, so the process it was interesting, and, and um, I'm going to acknowledge uh, Norman Swan as um, as a sort of an 
to help who helped us initiate the process we were thinking that we should we the institute were thinking we should develop a discussion paper of some form to be the basis of the consultations and uh, and Norman I think very wisely said no you should start with a blank sheet of paper so we did and um, Norman has been uh, facilitating consultation forums with us the first three uh, with with a uh, uh, specifically engaged stakeholders, I must say, people are really in, inside the tent in three state and territory capital cities uh, late last year, uh, really started with a blank piece of paper and built the, the draft strategy materials up from a blank piece of paper. We then sent that, that sort of very initial draft strategy around the country and um, have done consultation sessions in all states and territories, except ACT, which is yet to come. Uh, also a consultation with um, Indigenous Health Leadership um, uh, Forum. Um, and the result of those consultations has been the draft strategy framework that you've been provided with um, in advance of this session today. And the strength really I see is that it has been something that's been built from the ground up. It doesn't really represent what the independent expert panel's views are. It doesn't certainly doesn't represent what AHW's views are. It's really what the stakeholders' views are. And I think that's a real strength and it will be a strength going forward with following the consultation today. And we're very, look, very much looking forward to your inputs. Um, just to let people know, after, after the finish of these consultations, we will prepare with the panel um, or the, the, for the panel's approval uh, a draft strategy document. I think the next phase of consultations will be to focus on um, engaging with the Commonwealth and State and Territory Health Authorities and senior officials within those um, departments um, before the, the document is finalised and sent through to RMAC and then on to Health Ministers for approval. We're hoping probably early next year. We were hoping by the end of this year, but I think with the COVID situation, things are being slowed down a bit, but we're hopeful that we'll be able to get something through to Health Ministers uh, for the beginning of next year. And then it will be, become a published document. Um, it's uh, someone has already met, I think Leanne also already mentioned the principles um, behind that have been established as part of the documentation. We're hoping that we're expecting that the end document will have some strategic goals also as well as the principles. It will be a document that will that will provide guidance we're hoping for national health information for a period of 10 to 15 years. So quite an ambitious document, something that says where do we need to go to over the longer term? How do we need to think about where we're going? given the very changing environment with, as Leanne mentioned, increases in data availability, data complexity, and increases in expectations of data availability and the ability for people to easily access the data to help drive health and welfare improvements and health improvements um, in particular. Um, so the document will have those sort of strategic goals that will be sort of have like a 10 to 15 year sort of horizon uh, associated with them and then we'll have some more uh, on the ground action plans being developed. Some, some things which may not get done for, not for 10 to 15 years but other things that we would hope would be being done in the first three to four years and then perhaps in another three to four year plan following that. So Mark suggested that I um, also talk a little bit about what might be the benefits for consumers from this work and I think um, it's fair to say that we're trying to have consumers as, as, a, as a, a central audience here um, because consumers uh, have roles in, in shaping the health system and of course in using the health system and certainly have interest in ensuring that the health system provides um, the best quality care that, can, that is available. So I think that the benefits will be that we will have better data availability, we'll have better data quality and better data available to the range of users of the data, departments of, of health across the nation who are making decisions about how to provide health services and to researchers who are researching best ways of providing health services as well. I think the other thing that's going to be helpful is that, is that it will keep our focus on things like privacy and transparency and community trust. It's really important that this work goes forward with good, good levels of community trust and I think the situation that I've just been talking about with increased data availability, increased needs for data, increased numbers of people wanting to use the data for research and that sort of thing, means that 
that the system needs to be held to account in terms of privacy protection uh, for everyone in the community and also for transparency. I think that will be a benefit that the transparency will be there so that uh, there will be better information available to consumers and to everyone about what exactly are Australia's national health information holdings and data holdings, who holds them, what are the circumstances under which they're held, how are they used and joined up to help <coughs> provide information uh, through the research efforts, for example, to help to improve health information. So um, I think that's probably all I'll say at the moment, Mark. Um, so back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for that. Now for Neville Millen, who's a Victorian health researcher and consumer advocate. Neville will uh, say a little about how he sees the strategy from a consumer perspective. Neville. Thanks, Mark. Um, basically, knowledge is power. And uh, I've spent many years as an academic training people how to use um, raw data by teaching them by definite steps on how to understand use of statistical data and how to interrogate data so that we get uh, the possibly best outcomes so that people can sort of use the data to best effect. I've been for six years on the HIPCAG or the Orthopaedic Clinical Review Panel and uh, I was sort of able to get a consumer perspective on the way in which data is presented by various sponsors about their products. So basically from a data point of view, most consumers really come to data a little bit bamboozled, to be quite honest. I mean, we can look at doctors and nurses and researchers and they understand how to interrogate raw data. Most of the public don't, but as a, as a perspective of this particular uh, vision that you have for National Health Information Strategy, we'd hope that by running short courses and uh, things in TAFEs and universities that people may be able to understand how to interrogate personal data uh, in various ways. Now, information, if you want to see as data, the interrogation process is really a didactic or instructive one. I've been quite impressed with the COVID virus presentation on the ABC uh, the way in which they've showed the progression models of some of the different countries and the way in which the uh, progression rates look. And this is all based explaining to people about the process of uh, exponential curves and cetera, how to flatten curve. This is the sort of thing that consumers would want to see about their own illness profiles. So if you want to go to the meta level of which people come to understanding the health system, it's basically they come with a particular illness or a particular need uh, to interrogate the health system at the level of the hospital, the doctor, the surgeon. And so the most information that we can provide in an, in an educated way for them to understand their own illness profile is so important. Uh, it's a bit like sort of uh, the grand concept of a railway system, you know, people understand and trust that the system runs from station to station and people look after the rails. They're not so interested in the big picture. They're looking at the meta level, which they intersect with that system and they want to understand better their own illness profile and how that can be best uh, helped. And uh, I think the more that we can provide on this document here, for people to understand the system, to basically access it, read it, interrogate it, I think is a, is a way to make people understand that the health is in their own hands as much as other experts. And they need to understand that basically this is something that they can learn and they shouldn't be afraid of it. And this is something I've, I've been explaining to other people who are consumers that particularly in orthopaedics, that basically if they understand uh, what the process they're going through and what risks are involved and how the process goes from A to B, that people feel a lot more confident in their surgeon, their doctors and the system as a whole. So before Jenny was talking about building trust and confidence, I think people only get confidence if they're well informed and they need to inform themselves. And I think that that's the thing that I've been banging on for years with students is that if you can understand what you're reading 
uh, then you're in a better position to sort of help yourself and help others. Thank you, Neville. And now if uh, we ask Norman Swan to talk a little about the process so far in consultations on the National Health Information Strategy and also a little about the perspective we need or that is now with us with COVID. Norman. Thanks, um, Mark. So, um, I direct you to the document. I hope you've all got a copy on that uh, link that was sent to you by CHF. Um, and I'll just expand a little bit on what Jenny said. So essentially we started with a blank page. We've got people who really deeply know what they're talking about into rooms in uh, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth. And from that we developed a high level document and we started off with a principles based discussion. Um, and what you see at the beginning of the document are the principles that drive the document. If we've got those principles wrong, the rest of the document will not work out. So that's very important. And then what we did was we road tested the principles in the beginning of the document in other places, particularly Brisbane. And we've then built up the document to a much more complete document. And what we found as we went through that we've got the principles, well, you, you, you may choose as a group to disagree with that, which is fine because there's nothing precious and nothing set in stone. But we, we find ourselves with very little discussion about the preamble anymore, uh, very little discussion about the principles. People will think they're roughly right, but we're only too happy to take discussion on that. And what we're really trying to focus forward on is the end of the document, right at the end, the last two or three pages, which is where we talk about what we'd actually like to do, because you can have the best strategy document in the world, but we've actually got to focus on implementation. What would you actually do to move forward if those principles are roughly right? And that's the sort of discussion we would really appreciate, not to deny any others. So if I can just, uh, you, you know, the, um, and what we did to begin with was a gap analysis. Where would we like to be? Where are we now? What do we need to do to fill in the pieces? And what should the gaps and what should we, and what, what principles should drive that? And the analysis of the current state was, well, we've done quite a good job, but not good enough. Um, data lack coordinate. So just giving you a, a helicopter view of the critique is that um, data are not accessible enough at the right place at the right time, particularly for consumers. So consumers are seen as very important users of the system, reflecting a little bit on what Neville was talking about. Um, but you should be able to in a very practical way to be able to use the system yourself in a trusted way um, that the data uh, are not as coordinated as they should be. Um, I, think co I think consumers think that we have a much more co coordinated and linked data set than we actually have. It's much better than it used to be. So consumers expect, in many ways, the providers of the data are more nervous of consumers than consumers are nervous of the data. I think consumers have a high level of trust and assumption until, of course, that trust is breached. Um, and when you talk to consumers with chronic illness, they actually they actually want their data shared. They don't want to be telling the story 25 different times and they want it to be linked to what's useful. Um, so in many ways, the problem's not consumers. The problem's actually, we identified, at least in part, the data custodians. So you have a group of people who are um, under, under legislation, the custodians of data, of data sets, really quite valuable data sets. And they see themselves as uh, Roman centurions uh, guarding this at all costs with their shields and spears and sometimes even more powerful weapons than those. And because they're scared, because they're risk averse, and that mitigates against sharing data. And so one of the core concepts of the document that you see, and again, I'm just giving you a high level view of it, is moving the system away from custodianship to stewardship. So if you're actually in charge of a data set or responsible for it, your responsibility actually is to share it, not to guard it, but to share it and find trusted ways of sharing it. And we need to have systems in place where that can be done. Louisa Jorm is working on that in terms of a, a, a layer of trust that you can, a technological layer of trust that you can put in the system. Um, and there are lots of data that you don't need a lot of trust to, to access. You can, um, you know, the stuff that could be available to consumers, to nurses and doctors and others, which don't breach confidentiality, don't get behind, behind a firewall, wall, which would be immensely um, useful for them. 
So the whole, you know, at a high level, if we don't shake the system up through this strategy, gain more access to data, link it more, be able to use it, use it imaginatively for the end users, uh, whether they be health system managers, whether they be consumers, and whether they be healthcare professionals. That's the way, that's where we've got to get to. And within a framework where, um, where health, and you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, um, where health, and there's not a person on this webinar who uh, would not agree, is that health is far more than just, uh, you know, the old WHO thing, but essentially, if you're going to have data for health and well-being, you've got to have data about jobs, employment, uh, justice, pr imprisonment, policing, um, you know, social welfare, social services, abor you know, you know, for Aboriginal communities, there's got to be a lot of trust and a lot of data that's very useful for, the, for them. In many ways, Aboriginal communities, as always, are ahead of um, the, the game here. Um, but, you know, and we have consulted with the National Health Leadership Group um, uh, via Nacho uh, last week. So that's where you're trying to get to. And really what I wanted you to do if for the rest of this conversation, if it's possible, because I want to do a lot of listening is or hearing your chats and commenting on it, is um, is there something wrong with the principles? If so, it's really important to hear that because if we get that wrong, the rest it will flow through the rest of the document. And then I really want to jump to the back of the document where you have a look at that and look at the sorts of things that our stakeholders have said we need to do. And if there's big stuff missing, um, if there's stuff that you really annoys you and think it should not be there, we need to hear about that. And I accept that this is a bit anecdotal, what one person's saying it, but in fact, sometimes just one person saying something triggers an important issue that's been sitting at the back of our mind and needs to be much more to the fore. So that's really, you know, you know in a sense, I'm kind of directing your attention here. Um, but I do think that the front of the document with the principles and the back of the document in terms of actions are the most important parts. And if we get the back of the, either, if we get either one of those wrong, this document will be a disappointment. And remember, of course, it's not within our power. It's a gift of AMAC, and it's got to go through the health ministers and the, um, the chief executives of each health system. But you know, who knows that one of the benefits of COVID-19 may be this national cabinet concept where we actually might, we, we might move away from COAG and towards a national cabinet system, which is much more flexible, much more agile than we've had before. Um, COVID-19 has, there's a lot that's been hidden in the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And one of the things that's been hidden is, um, and I've seen it and trying to report it, is the data are not good. Um, you'd think that we'd at least have unified data and data definitions for COVID-19, and we don't. Um, and that is a problem. And... Um, so there's a lot of scrabbling to bring together the data and the sources of infections. You know, grossly, we're doing really well and we're getting down to very low levels. But if we fire up and get a second wave, I think it will declare some of these data problems that we got from the state. So even with this, which you think is incredibly simple, you know, is your nose wall positive or negative? Um, are you going um, at, at its very core? We've still got problems with that. Anyway, um, but there has been unprecedented co co you know, cooperation and you know, think things are looking positive that we're, what we might remain with after this pandemic is over, which may be a while, but um, moving forward. So that's, that's what I've got to say. Thanks. Thanks very much, Norman. Sharing, access, linking, a holistic approach that takes an the rest of the, all of social uh, issues. Uh, there's a lot to, for us to think about. I want to start uh, with the questions from the floor from Associate Professor Victoria Palmer from Melbourne University, who asks, will COVID-19 lead to greater health information sharing and integrated data systems across sectors? How will those with less voice in digital spaces be engaged in developing the National Health Information Strategy. Uh, perhaps if we put that 
to uh, Jenny, if you'd like to talk on this. Um, on, the, on the COVID situation, <clears throat> I mean, I think that my own personal view is that this is an opportunity, as I think Norman has sort of said, for us to really think about whether the national health information arrangements are suiting our needs at the moment. Um, and <clears throat> we, I know at the, at, the, at AIHW where we work, for example, we collate hospitals data, but it's not a, not a timely data collection. It doesn't have good information about, for example, how many ventilators there are. We couldn't actually be a source of information for the community at the moment about have we got enough ICU beds? How are the hospitals being um, used for COVID uh, cases? And conversely, how are the hospitals being used for other, others, other people whilst the COVID uh, pandemic is occurring? We just don't have that sort of real-time information available at the national level. And it's, and it's something that we need to think about. Um, I think also we, we don't have the really good information to join up um, sort of patient journeys, if you like. So we have separate silos of information on hospitals data, on MBS and PBS data, deaths data. It's not routinely made uh, available so that it can be joined up. And again, in real time, being able to be used to ask questions about what is happening right now to inform uh, dis discussion and decision making about what needs to be happening next week, rather than looking back sort of, you know, months or years in, in the past. So I think um, there is opportunities here to be really using the COVID situation to be thinking about what do we want in the future? What are the limitations that we have in the system at the moment and how can we take, um, take action now or in the near future uh, in the light of the COVID uh, pandemic situation? Um, the other question about uh, voices for people who are not digitally um, uh, digital experts, um, I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, we are through this consultation process trying to hear as many types of voices as we can. Um, it's always a challenge to be able to hear all the voices that we need to have. What we haven't done very much of um, in the work to date is think about governance arrangements for, this, for the strategy going forward. We're quite mindful that governance around health, national health information, like the health information itself, is a bit siloed. Um, and I think we've got an opportunity there to think about if we want to have a joined up system that's going to suit multiple purposes and multiple audiences, including people who may not have um, a lot of digital skills, then what are the appropriate governance arrangements for that? What are the appropriate uh, decision makers to have around the table? What are the appropriate advisory arrangements to advise those decision makers. Um, and I think you've just made a good point that we need to think about people who are not, don't have high digital skills. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Um, a question for Leanne uh, from Susie, who asks, uh, what opportunity is there for COAG or the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council to facilitate through the new health information strategy, an uptake of a new way of healthcare planning philosophy in our health system, i.e. dealing with a patient journey, um, uh, given we'll have better access, hopefully, to patient and health information. Mm. Thanks, Mark. Um, look, I think it goes without saying that, um, you know, we all heard the rhetoric around patient-centred or person-centred policy and service design. I think everything really does need to start with the patient and the centrality of the consumer experience. So um, we know people, uh, you know, they, they very rarely interface with just one service. Um, so if we can be thinking in policy terms, but also in terms of data and data linkage terms about the patient journey and using that as our framing, um, I think that's a very important principle. And I'll come back to how that speaks to the principles in the document that Norman pointed us to in a minute. Um, you know, so I think what we've got the opportunity to do here with the National Health Information Strategy is, is to, as Jenny said, in a, in a, with a 10 to 15 year horizon, um, really create an authorising environment um, to, to really drive that, that practice home. And there's already pockets of that already happening. We know that um, local hospital networks and primary health networks through initiatives like Health Pathways 
are, are anchoring a lot of their thinking, a lot of their planning and a lot of their commissioning um, on, on patient journey and patient transitions. So I guess what that says to me is that um, if we're thinking that patient journey and starting with that um, as a really high order um, point of principle, um, back to Norman's question about have we got some of the principles in the draft document for the NHIS right, um, it suggests to me um, that we have to a large degree in that we are talking about um, patient, if we're talking about patient journey, people transition from service to service, they transition from setting to setting. Um, and those settings are not just healthcare settings, but also social care and community care and aged care settings. So a principle that data needs to be fit for purpose and drawn from um, not only service experience, um, service utilisation, but also relevant data and data that is available or could be available from community services or jobs and employment status, as Norman was saying, uh, says to me that that data being fit for purpose as a principle, um, we've largely got right. Um, I suppose the other reflection I'd have too about patient, patient journey and patient experience is back to Norman's, uh, uh, <clears throat> Neville's point about how um, uh, enabling data and being able to understand personal data um, is, is enabling from a health literacy, service navigation, being confident to self-manage more effectively. Um, I think that's a really important point that Neville made. And back to the principles, I suppose, in the document, we are just looking at here, we do talk about the health workforce being data enabled as a principle. Um, but, but I guess, and it's a question to the audience, I guess, too, about whether or not we have more sufficiently strongly captured that um, we also want the health consumer to be data enabled from a, from a, from a health literacy, um, uh, self-care perspective. So just some observations on that patient journey question there. Thanks, Mark. Uh, a question for Neville, going on from what Leanne was just saying, uh, Penelope asks, data systems are only as good as the entered data. How could the NHIS work with stigmatised groups to improve the rate at which health information is volunteered to health providers and the accuracy with which practitioners record sensitive information? What's your perspective on that, Neville? Uh, look, basically, I think that, you know, the whole issue with regard data in and data out, you know, basically, I think what Norman was saying before is that we've got to have much more coordinated data uh, and people who would belong to, say, illness groups. I mean, I know with the Chronic Illness Alliance, which I'm aligned with, uh, they seek information from 39 different groups. But basically, I think it's up to the government to listen to people. I always remember reading a book called The Wounded Storyteller, you know, by a Canadian academic, you know, Arthur Frank. And in that, he was saying that the medicos don't really listen to the depth story of people. So I think it's up to the people who suffer these illnesses to really get down and negotiate uh, how they're seen, the perspective in which they're seen. And they should be very open and honest to provide information. I think one of the things that I've always found very difficult through my career is that people, they say, don't really want to give you information about their illnesses. But when you actually go and visit people and talk to them, they virtually tell you their life history. I think we actually have to start listening to some of the depth nuances in which people talk about their illnesses, etc., and recognise this as legitimate data. It may not be hard, detailed data, but there's ways in which data can be collected in a qualitative way, which can be negotiated to inform quantitative analysis. So I think that it's important to listen to people's stories and seek ways in which we can actually generate information. Now, as I mentioned before, the ABC has been presenting some excellent um, 
profiles on the coronavirus and they've been talking about sort of exponential curves and and progression rates etc this is basically instructing people about the data and how to read it and interrogate it because they put the equations up they talk about the way in which the quotient of the previous uh cases as against the cases for that particular day and people can see whether it's going up or down if we instruct people uh, carefully in in reading data it gives them the confidence to not only understand it but to present it and give it forward so i think this is a matter of a didactic experiment of getting people to feel confident to present their views their stories and their data effectively and then I think we'll have a much more enabling, uh, enhancing of data literacy across the whole profile of society, not just necessarily the doctors and nurses and those who work in the field, but people who are actually uh, the consumers of this particular product. Data, to me, is a product and it can be consumed like everything else within the system. Thanks, Neville. Uh, something for Norman. Uh, Claire says that and reading through all the material on the NHIS, she doesn't see any focus on health economics. High level data, she says, can be used not only to improve health outcomes, but also to make our health system more efficient. Has economics been deliberately excluded from the NHIS discussion paper? Norman and or Jenny, what can you say? Um, well, I might I might start start Mark. It um, certainly hasn't been an intention to exclude it. Um, we have, I, th I think, there's some references um, here and there to improving the improving health services, the efficiency of health services, as well as the the quality of health services. So we're always trying to think about those different type, different qualities of uh, of health services, if you like. Um, safety and quality of healthcare is important, but also for the system. Uh, the efficiency that, and the cost efficiency of care is very important. So we, we didn't mean to exclude that. We, if, if, it's, if that's coming across, then that's, thank you for that comment. I think we'll need to, um, need to ensure that we make that a bit clearer. Mm. We're also, I think, I think we've been, there's been a sense from some people, I think that this seems, this focus here is on sort of, you know, information about um, episodes of care for patients, I suppose, and sort of patient journeys and things. But we really are intending to have this serve the purpose of informing the system as well. And that, that's when it often becomes issues around uh, costs and, and benefits at the aggregate level, which is, um, which is certainly intended to be there. So we'll, we'll ensure that, that that's given a bit more um, uh, prominence, perhaps. Um, so just to add to that, in that very first round of uh, where we had nothing, we actually had health economists as part of that. In fact, one of our principles, which I'm kind of a bit disappointed we haven't got there anymore, but um, which I thought was a pretty good one, which is that um, the principle should be that we get value from money from the public investment in data, which I think says, uh, says it all in terms of what we need to do is a vast amount of money invested in data, not enough, um, but we're probably not getting the maximum value from it. So yeah, I agree with Jenny. Um, health economics is part of it. We've not been, we've perhaps not been as explicit as we, as we should be, um, because but that's an essential part. It goes back to the previous question as well about coherent planning. Can't do it without economists there. And I think economists can help us create the imperative to get the best possible use of data. Because if you look at it as an economic challenge, the use of data, um, we are incredibly inefficient, all this data, and not linked up enough and usable enough. Thanks, Norman. Um, a question for Leanne. Uh, I don't know whether it's an issue or how big an issue it is, but Kath asks, how will consumers feel if others have better access to their own data than they do? How can we make sure they get equal access? Now, I'm going on the presumption uh, that the data available in the scheme will be for equal access, but is this worth commenting on, Leanne? Well, I think the, I mean, I suppose it just highlights the, the, the broader principles around um, 
how do how do we ensure at a sort of a more macro level um, in terms of national data sets and other other points where we capture data that that's happening in a, a transparent high trust way and you know I think that's why you know we've been very strong both on the IEP and in and our members through the consultation that um, a trusted transparent environment and set of um, principles and practices um, are just so fundamentally important. It, th this is all about social licence for, for consumers. And um, I think we know from our research that, um, as I said before, you know, consumers want a sense of control and ownership of their own data. And where they're comfortable, um, you know, as Jenny said, or Norman, I can't remember who it was, most people want to know that, that, that data and information about them is being linked up. That was a whole argument about My Health Record. Um, you know, often they um, imagine that data is being connected and linked so, so they don't have to um, repeat their story. We're, the rub is in how we, how we get consent and how that's done transparency, transparently and how the social licence around that operates. So... Um, you know, I think people want visibility on their data. They want to comprehend and understand and interrogate their data. So the principle of the more we can make available on an equal basis, the better, I would say. Um, but, but um, you know, how we operationalised consent and informed consent um, is equally important. And sometimes practices around that are pretty lax. And we know that's important for consumers. Um, but for the most part, you know, the assurance comes um, when people have a sense that their data is being used for public good. And we saw that with the My Health Record debates time and time again, that um, it, they're more than happy to make an, in, an informed consent decision about their data being available if it's being used for good policy, good service design, public good. Um, much, much more concerned about um, their data being used for commercial and other purposes. So, you know, I think it, it, it talks to whether it's equal access or, um, you know, uh, uh, just consent around appropriate access for various points in the system, I think is more the issue. Thanks, Leanne. A, a question uh, going on from that for Neville, this comes from Avis, who asks, since the general population has such limited understanding of statistical analysis, how could the NHIS provide useful information for consumers to readily understand it? Yeah, well, having worked in a distance education system at Deakin University and taught people a Masters of Applied Social Research at distance, you can but you basically have to keep everything pretty comprehensive. I think that what we found is you either have podcasts, you have PowerPoints, and keep them very simple. You can instruct people how to read uh, information connected to data and data connected to information. And I think that one of the best ways that I could see is that once the government decides on some sort of platform to present information. Remember, 5G network is coming soon and speed of delivery of information will be 10 times faster than it is now. And so basically, we've got the platform and then we have to have a system of tiles or whatever that people can access, press on, and then they can listen to a podcast, a link with slides, explaining uh, how this particular data informs their illness situation or what they're trying to seek. And uh, we might have to go out to community centres or run short courses for people to really understand how they interpret what's going on. It can be done, but it's going to take time. But I believe it's pretty empowering. And uh, like everything else, it doesn't happen immediately. People have to have an open mind. And if they really want to learn, it's basically listening to step-by-step -step instruction on how to understand directions and to read the information. See, one of the things that people say to me is, uh, how do I find out how much it's going to cost me with my surgeon, you know, to do something? Well, 
that's just information. That's not data. And if when I lived in the United States, 22 states of America, you can look that up and find out, but you can't do that here. So that's, Thank you. That's one of the places we could start. Indeed. Thanks. Thanks, Neville. Um, Pam Wood, uh, maybe this is a question from the, for the panel to, to answer to if they wish. And that is, Pam asks, how are or should people already stigmatised and lacking trust within healthcare setting be brought along on this journey to create the National Information Health Strategy? I mean, I think the people who need it most often are, of course, those least likely to use it. Do we, are there views about how we can make sure the benefits of the health information strategy improve lives for those who are least likely to know or use it? Do you have a view, Norman? Norman's view. You need to unmute me. Um, so I, I do have a view on that. Um, and it's about understanding what people's information needs are. So I think this is where information is more important than data. So that's the, if you like, you, know, you could spend all day defining what information is, but essentially it's data that's useful for making decisions and decisions about your life and so on and so forth. And we should be able to, for example, have views about, um, you know, this, this has not come out of the strategy, but I've, I've kind of used it as a case study. If you've got congestive heart failure, um, you should be able to know um, what the average hospitalization rate is in Australia for people with congestive heart failure, maybe the average hospitalization rate for people overseas, and your own hospitalization rate. And if you're going to hospital more often than the average, that's you, that, that should be information that you and your general practitioner share because you're outside, you're, you're an outlier. Um, and you should be able to benchmark that. Now, if you're somebody who um, is disadvantaged, live alone, you may have some dementia attached to that and not be able to use that data, then your carer should be able to use that data. Um, and the knowledge that the health system, the, the, the health system knows that you've got that data, the health system will be pushed to perform better because of sunlight. And, but that sunlight requires integration, coordination, and, um, you know, and, and that information is available. It's not as if we need to create new data sets, but we need to be able to interrogate existing data sets better. And people need to stop guarding their data because they're frightened that they might be blamed for the fact that you've had more preventable, avoidable hospitalizations for heart failure than you might otherwise have had. It's not about blame, it's about people gaining control. And just as an example. Thanks, Norman. Uh, a question from Pip, uh, and that is, what is the opportunity to engage via citizens' juries with many months' commitment to make the National Health Information Strategy work well? Um, I, well, I'm happy to have a, make a comment if you like, Thank Mark. You. Um, yeah, citizens' juries are uh, an interesting, interesting thing, and I've been aware of, of some work being done by the University of Wollongong in recent times around health issues and citizens' juries. Um, we, this, the process that we've had to date to develop the strategy, I think uh, it's fair to say we, we haven't thought about citizens' juries. Um, we've been pleased to be able to have sessions like this um, we are, we haven't, I must say, we haven't um, got sort of our unlimited resources, so we have to have to be a little bit careful about what we spend money on in, in, this, in this phase. But, you know, maybe that's something that we need to be thinking about for the next, next iteration or the first action plan that sits under the strategy. Um, as I mentioned before, we haven't had a lot of thought about governance and advisory arrangements um, going forward. Um, nor, I guess, on how some of the ideas that are sort of necessarily going to be at fairly high level because we're trying to paint a picture for what will happen over the next 10 to 15 years. I think necessarily there's going to have to be some more planning work following along from this strategy and maybe um, citizens juries would be would have a, a role there. Um, we'll have to see, I think. Rob, thanks. Jenny, does, uh, 
do you have any views on this, Leanne? Look, I think I think I would um, echo Jenny's point. Um, I mean, I'm I'm no expert in citizens juries, but they, from what I do know about them, they seem to me to lend themselves um, more to uh, where you've got a priority setting exercise ahead of you, or or a particular problem to solve that you you want to work through. So. I think Jenny's right. Um, uh, you know, we've had um, a ground up, let's let's build some consensus around the principles and the broad areas for possible action for the strategy. As Norman said, the two, the two important elements of the strategy are the principles and the action areas. Um, how we prioritise um, and make decisions or make recommendations um, around areas for investment, priority areas for action, and within those priority areas of action to answer the what question, well, what would you actually do to operationalise or implement that? Um, you know, there's any number of processes you can use there. There's sort of um, citizens' juries, the sort of Delphi methods. Um, it just depends how sophisticated you want to get. And as Jenny said, on the resources and time you've got. Thank you, Leanne. Norman, we're... Coming near the conclusion, um, would you like to sort of round up, uh, make any concluding comments about the sorts of themes you think have come through today? Well, I think that uh, the, uh, it's been very useful and it's been very grounded. And I think that um, it's hard for, um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a reasonably detailed document. And I think as a curtain raiser for the, you know, the health consumers community, it's been very, very useful and very useful to hear these questions. I think um, what Jenny and I and sort of the Institute would uh, like is that if people got specific comments on the implementation strategy, when you go through to the actions and the priorities there, if anybody's got any comments, they could email it through to CHF and CHF can um, triage them and send them on. That would be great. Because I think that what we really need to focus on is what we do next, what's the menu of action, you know, what are the priorities here to move forward? Um, and, you know, big stuff, not moving around little words here and there, but just big stuff, that would be really useful, I think. Don't you agree, Jenny? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Very happy to have um, comments come through by email. Well, thank you all, and thank you, uh, you know, you are out there in the audience. We've had uh, quite a keen response. More questions, I'm afraid, than we have time to answer. But it is reassuring to know that there's a lot of people who see this as a very important issue. And I guess, as I've mentioned earlier, it seems much more important now because of COVID. So thank you for joining. And I'm sure that we will be back in this space with more developments on national health information. And Mark, can I just say, if people do want to send in comments on, particularly in those areas that Norman flagged, um, just send them through to info at chf.org.au. Um, we're very happy to consolidate those and send them on um, to, to the AOHW. Thank you, Leanne. Just once more, that's info at chf.org.au. Uh, please feel free to send through our comments, responses to this webinar. Thank you and good afternoon. Bye.